Welcome to this moment in democracy. This episode was recorded on September 21st, 2023. I'm your host, Saladin Ambar. 15 years ago, populist politicians and parties were seen as a reactionary blip, which would soon fade. But they are not only still present, but gaining strength and power across the globe. In recent years, we've witnessed a seismic shift in the political landscape, both here in the United States and around the world. From Brexit to the rise of unconventional leaders and movements, the forces of populism have shaken the foundations of traditional politics. And there's no better person to help us navigate this complex terrain than our special guest today, Governor John Corzine. Today, we'll explore how this phenomenon has shaped current events, influenced elections, and what it means for the future of governance. Governor, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, I appreciate it very much to have the opportunity and look forward to the conversation. Thanks. Likewise. So you you could be doing a lot post-governorship, post-politics. What is it that drew you to think about and really consider populism as a force uh, in our world today? Well, the truth be known, I taught a political science course at Farley Dickinson, and I emphasized populism in that process. So I did a little thinking about it in a structural sense um, to get started. But I think anyone that's interested in American politics, historically or otherwise, runs across the theme of populism through our history. uh, Whether you're talking about Andrew Jackson, who uh, invited half the country to the White House for his inauguration to... uh, Uh, his uh, anti-Native American actions before he was in the White House, um, through uh, the progressive populist movements of the late 19th century or uh, America first uh, in front of World War II. It's just, it's been a recurring theme in our our American life. And uh, we're going through another bout of it. It's Sometimes on the left, sometimes on the right. It's not a, it's not a consistent pattern. It's more of a framework for politicians and groups of people who are interested in change or often protecting the status quo uh, to uh, rise up and express their point of view. And so, I, you know, I think it's one of the most interesting things that is consistent in politics and. I think you get the idea that I liked it since I spent probably 12, 15 years of my life doing it. Uh, I do it that. The happiest uh, part uh, of my life. Well, it's funny you mention Andrew Jackson. I happen to be teaching uh, about him in my upcoming uh, class on the, on the presidency next week. So maybe this, uh, this talk will be extra credit for, for my <laughs> students. Um, but you, you raise a good point about the left and the right being both identified with populism. Do you think it plays out differently, or, uh, or is the appeal uh, somewhat the same regardless of party or ideological point on the spectrum? Populism, as I understand it, generally is an expression of frustration with something. Um, economic uh, inequality, uh, uh, it can be a frustration with uh, a level of corruption that it seems to exist in the system. Corruption, not just about money, but uh, how the system works. Uh, it's anti-institutional. Uh, all those kinds of things um, tend to not be just a left or right issue. Um, they tend to be associated with the people who are out of power. Uh, at their start, um, and populism is a framework to raise that up. I mean, um, perfect example of this uh, was roughly 2010. I think we had Occupy Wall Street. Uh, A group of wild-eyed liberals uh, spent 90 days uh, protesting uh, inequality, the 99% uh, against the 1%. But at the same time, the Tea Party uh, was forming and getting its footing uh, on the right, um, basically, uh, to uh, push back against the Obama administration's uh, policies, particularly with regard to health care. But it's uh, so it has a foot in both worlds. And sometimes those combine. Sometimes they uh, uh, you can see someone. 
like maybe J.D. Vance, who's an right. Ohio senator, who um, talked, if you read his book, Hillbilly Elegy, you would, you'd almost thought he was a liberal, talking about how uh, poverty impacted people's lives and communities and went on. And he turns up uh, a Trumpian uh, uh, conservative. So I think there's... Uh, there's a lot to be said that it is more of a framework for discussion of or issues uh, that politicians want to raise. It's got a whole bunch of we against them uh, in almost every aspect, a lot of it unattractive. I would say that's a very good definition of populism. I think that that, that definition holds. Um, and yet, you know, 2010 seems like eons ago in many ways, uh, as, and it really isn't, obviously, but it does. And, and I think maybe because there seems to be something a little darker, not that there always there ha- hasn't always been a dark element within populism, but things seem to be a bit darker. And I'm thinking about as awful, frankly, uh, as a candidate as someone like a Governor Wallace was, right. uh, who tapped into that sort of populism. There was the old theory that you know peop- there were some people who were gonna, willing to vote for, for Wallace and some who were willing to vote for uh, Bobby Kennedy. Um, what is, if, if anything has changed... Well, there were, you know, yeah, just, right just to take that a step Please. further, mm-hmm. I mean, there's a, a huge cohort, not a huge, but a significant cohort of people who voted for Obama yes. and then in turn voted for Trump. And um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't have the numbers at the tip of my tongue, but I think it was roughly a third. I mean, it's not an insignificant number of people, and um, you can see some of that now with the movement of some of the minorities vote in America now, seeming to slip off towards the populist argument. Uh, whether it's uh, Latino voters or um, even African American man, um, seem to have a greater affinity. Not, not. It's not the majority, but it is a meaningful amount of movement going on that are brought about, I think, by populist arguments. And I think we've seen that before. And again, I want to come back to uh, maybe something, uh, a sentiment, perhaps I'm exaggerating, which is this darker force. And obviously, we, we've all lived through January 6th and, and, and saw what that portended at, in that moment and perhaps even beyond for, for this country. Um, is there something new or novel about populism and or um, what's taking place in American politics more broadly that... Um, made that event, shocking as it was, occur, whereas it, it, it's hard for me to think back, and I didn't live through that period, although I study it in the late 60s and thinking about Wallace and thinking about Bobby Kennedy, etc. Uh, that moment happened, whereas it was sort of unimaginable, it seemed to me, in that moment. Or am I being a bit naive? I, I, first of all, I don't think you're being naive, but populism has had a dark side to it, Throughout history, we started with the discussion of Andrew Jackson. I mean, I don't, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think close to a million uh, Native Americans were either killed or forced to migrate uh, out of their native country, native lands. Uh, you know, there's. It would be hard to say that uh, some of the uh, the riots that occurred in the late uh, 19th century weren't pretty violent uh, until uh, Teddy Roosevelt came along and sort of uh, led us away from populism to progressivism. And goodness, um, Father Coughlin and sure. Lindbergh and some of that crowd um, basically were making the Nazis' argument in the United States. So I think they're. Even though it is dark, and I don't disagree with you, um, matter of fact, I think the fragility of our democracy, representative democracy, is very high right now, and there certainly is an individual or a group of individuals that would argue that we need a more authoritarian uh, uh, way to approach solving some of these longstanding problems that society has. And no one can really, I mean, no one that believes in democracy can really 
embrace that kind of thought. And I think it is very dangerous. It's got a lot of racism and anti-Semitism and a lot of, a lot of hate, almost hate built into the system uh, that is espoused. And I, you know, I totally dislike it. And I think uh, your generation and younger generations uh, need to push back very hard against it uh, uh, through political action. And if I can be an old guy that helps, I will. I like the idea of me as a young guy, so I'll take any chance I can, I can get to, to, to carry that banner. Look, you, you, you've you had a, quite an extraordinary life. Um, as someone who's um, experienced life outside of dominant major political institutions, you were a Marine, you attended a public university, uh, but you've also uh, had a time with Goldman Sachs, you've been a senator, you've been a governor, obviously, and... I guess the question to ask is someone who's been an insider and an outsider, I guess, you know, um, who's had different life experiences. Mm -hmm. What can you share with people who maybe haven't had that um, experience with, from within to, to suggest that, you know, there is something that populists or people are getting right about our political institutions, but maybe there's something that they're getting wrong about them. What, what, how, do you, how, do you, how might you speak to that? What are people maybe um, missing about our institutions, or maybe what are they getting right about them? Well, I think one of the things that they may be getting right, um, since I'm not going through this process now, but when I was a young person, I went to the University of Illinois at $125 a semester. Great institution, great avenue for access to all kinds of things that happen that you reviewed sort of in the quick resume that would have never happened if I hadn't had that opportunity. Now, to go to a public university, uh, you're either going to accumulate a lot of debt, but you're going to end up paying twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000 a year minimum, maybe even more. And it is very hard for people to have the access that I think my generation had at upward mobility. And... Um, I think populism is rightly identifying you know, people who embrace some of the populist arguments are identifying that as a weakness in our system and that yeah. while uh, Occupy Wall Street might have been exaggerated, there is a concentration of wealth it has nothing to do with ethnicity or race or anything else. It's just wealthy people are perpetuating that status quo, and it has created, I think, uh, less upward mobility than we've had most of the time in our history. And uh, that, I think, is a problem, and I think on that score, uh, identifying the issue is really important, how you approach it and how you uh, deal with it uh, is another element. I, I want to... Absolutely wanted to get this quote from H.L. Mencken into this discussion. I love Mencken. Go for cause, it. Because <laughs> I saw Mitt Romney used it, and I used it in my class. But he says, uh, for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. <laughs> That's what populism uh, does a pretty good job mm -hmm. of saying, hey, we got a problem. And it's ticking people off broadly, maybe even a majority of people. Mm -hmm. And... The answer is going to be complex, but often the messenger who's trying to attack it in populism has a clear and simple and wrong answer. I love it. And thank you for bringing up Mencken, who's a very astute observer of this country. Um, you know, I wonder about people who are adamant and um, hostile, angry, upset, and in many instances, rightly so. But I also wonder about the mass of people, it seems, who are just utterly disengaged and nonplussed and just going about their daily lives, who see no stake whatsoever uh, for themselves in the political process or in our major institutions. Uh, and that's an ongoing problem. I don't think we talk about that enough. Um, what is your sense of, you know, the person, you know, here, here in New Brunswick, you know, the guy or the woman who's giving you your bagel in the morning, who... You know, you ask them about politics, they could care less, or they're just uninformed and maybe intentionally uninformed because they've got things to do. How do we get those folks to care and to care in a way that's going to make a difference? 
it's a tough question, but it's an understandable reality. If you are the person that's sitting behind the uh, cash register at the 7-Eleven making $12 an hour, maybe, or maybe a little bit more, and you're having trouble filling your car full of gas so you can get there and making sure that there's child care or somebody's watching your child while you're doing things, you're just way more interested in getting through the day uh, safely and healthfully. Yeah. And I think that it is understandable why people give that a greater emphasis. Plus, I think that um, our institutions are slower moving in addressing some of these issues uh, than I think the public thinks they will be. And politicians, including myself, say, I've got an agenda, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And Sometimes it doesn't always end up happening in the way that people heard it framed by those who speak in the public forum. And there's a great deal of frustration that builds up. And after a while, people yeah, just are sure. so frustrated. Um, they're all the same. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I don't like it. And I think that's why we need to update our institutions. Uh, on a more regular basis, we need to um, we need to hold our politicians accountable to um, get things done. But um, we also need to make sure that there is a public discourse about how important participatory polit um, democracy is. You're only going to get the government that happens because people participate. Um, you know as a, uh, as a teacher that to get your students involved is not as, it's not an, a lay down hand. People, uh, uh, they've got a lot of other things going on. And until um, it impacts their lives in some way that they think they can change it through politics, they often don't. But, you know, there are so many issues that are on the agenda that impact people's lives that even that person at the 7-Eleven talked about, I right. mentioned child care, nothing could be more important than us renewing child tax credits and making it refundable and other things that allow people to work, in my view. Nothing's going to be more important for the people sitting in your classroom is for the political system to figure out what the hell it's going to do with right. AI, and you know how you're going to how you're going to put fences, some kind of regulatory fence around it, so that we can get the benefits but not the uh, the challenges. Um, there's a lot at stake that goes through the political system that I don't think people focus on enough, and I don't think that. People who, other than those that are seeking elections, speak about it enough. You you see what's going on in Congress now, and whether whether it's uh, you know Hunter Biden or something that Lauren Boebert has done in a theater. You you see uh, the sort of the circus level uh, quality to what's happening, and and I think it's fair to say when you were in the Senate, there was still a, a level of decorum and institutional integrity. Uh, maybe some of it had, had waned, but it seemed to be a still strong, vital institution. Um, how, how do we get Congress to work to create the kind of policies that you just mentioned? Well, I, I think there is a leadership problem in the country. I mean, I had mentioned um, earlier that Theodore Roosevelt really took the good part of the populist movement in the 1890s and made an agenda. We ended up with a progressive income tax system. We ended up uh, national park systems and some commitment to conservation. Uh, not everything was perfect, but they took a lot of the things that were fundamental to the populist movement and co-opted it and made it happen. We have to have that now. And I'm going to show some of my bias, even though I'm up there in age myself, I think we need, we need a younger generation of leaders um, that 
are living with the problems and are also going to have to live with the results uh, to verbalize how we bring about change going forward. And I think um, I think that's one of the big big problems. Yeah. Uh, we're we're led by um, waning baby boomers and. <laughs> Um, the world is changing very rapidly in front of us. And not that baby boomers don't have a lot to offer. They, they have great perspective and experience. On the other hand, um, the, uh, the results of what goes on in our system now, I think, needs to be in the hands of younger generations. And I think if you look back in history, the people who have made major shifts in our society and have been our great leaders, have been generally on the young side. Yeah, and, you know, whether it's Franklin Roosevelt sure. or John Kennedy or mm -hmm. uh, even Lyndon Johnson, who had a terrific uh, legislative record, was in his 50s. And you, That's right. you, you, you look at our history, the founding fathers and on up, mostly been people of generation that are going to have to live with their own cooking. <laughs> it's a great point. You think, and then movement leaders like Dr. King in their 30s, yeah, right? So, it's really incredible. incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as someone who's had um, a career and a life in the private sector, but also public service, you know, we got lots of students and hopefully my own children listening to this who are soon to be of college age. You can cross yourself or pray for me or do whatever <laughs> you, you need to do if you're listening. Um, Save a lot of money. Yeah, they're, they're, they're 16-year-old triplets. And I wonder about, yeah, well, there you go. Um, you know, we'll put a link in the description for a, a GoFundMe for, no, that's a joke, people. That's a joke. Um, but in all seriousness, um, what do you say to people who are looking to make a difference? Is there one over the other that is more suited Thinking about your own life in politics, but also in the private sector. Is there uh, an avenue that's more suited to making a difference um, of the kind we're, we're talking about? Well, I think you can make a difference in both. Okay. I mean, it's how you use the outcomes of your private sector participation, mm -hmm. uh, in my view, that allows you to be generous. It allows you to be... Uh, potentially, if you've succeeded and gotten lucky like I did, uh, to express your point of view in the public forum maybe a little more readily. Some people don't like that, but I, I thought it was a great advantage. So I didn't, I didn't object to uh, or have in, in, any... Um, I, I like being in the private sector when I was there. Sure. I mean, you, you know, you could have health care for all your workers. You could have daycare for all your workers. You could have, you, you, as a leader of a of an important organization, you could you could diversify your workforce. You could you you have a lot more independence to do things on a micro basis that I think are very positive and setting an example outside. Uh, on the other hand, the 12, 13 years that I spent in public service are the, the most rewarding. And I think I was probably the happiest. That's ever, interesting. Because um, you, you were getting an answer in scale if you were able to get something accomplished, um, particularly with regard to social needs in society, and I was pretty much a liberal by all measurements. Um, and I thought we, you know, both in, in the Senate and some of the things we did uh, as governor, um, paid family leave, there are, there are a, whole, a whole series of things, expanded health care and early childhood education, felt really, really positive sense of feedback by seeing what was happening not mm. by people right. telling me things so that was good um we had some tragedy that i think that anyone who has an empathetic sympathetic ear 9 11 happened when i was in the senate and i saw right. a lot of families broken and dealing with but you could do something right 
um, uh, about how you administered public policy. I think we had a hand in that. Um, I voted against the war in Iraq in 2003, one of 23 senators. And I think ended up having a voice on something that people probably didn't elect me to have a voice on. But um, I thought it was very important to be able to try to examine facts and bring facts to how you make a judgment on uh, important issues. So I, I think public service is really, really rewarding. If you like people and you really are trying to help at some very basic level, then I think it's one of the most rewarding things, and I'd encourage people to be involved with it. You talked about young people. Yeah. One of the greatest jobs that I saw um, that uh, a political office can do is bringing people in uh, as staffers on the Hill, in the governor's office. And I've seen these people build great, great careers, sure. both on the public side, and sometimes they just learned how to work really hard and they're doing really well in, um, in the private sector. So I think a, um, a good starter uh, starting point for a lot of people young people who are coming out of school get into the fray early and yeah. you know you work hard probably don't get paid as much as you would on the other side but you'll learn a lot and you'll probably get a lot more authority or opportunity to do things so uh, i would be very encouraging that concept oh it's it's fascinating to me that you um d- describe that as the happiest time for you professionally so that's uh and perhaps personally um that's that's uh terrific to hear um you mentioned paid family leave and a host of other achievements is there one um achievement in your political career that you're proudest of and then just to follow up with that is there something that you said boy you know if i had another crack at that i'd like to tackle that because i didn't really get to do what i wanted to do there well i think that uh at the end of the day, my uh, efforts in setting the agenda and improving the educational system that New Jersey had and has today, which is probably the best consistently performing public education system in the country, um, is one of my most proud moments. We did stuff for early childhood education and um, even some tolerance for uh, uh, charter schools and places where things weren't working as well as we would like to see for a lot of different reasons um, really made me proud of uh, the people that I worked with. But we did a lot of of things. Uh, The one thing that I felt most frustrated with um, probably had something to do with my not being reelected is I had this grand scheme that I thought I could figure out the finances hmm. and solve a lot of the financial problems through what quote unquote they called the monetization of the turnpike oh yeah <laughs> uh, I remember not well. exactly a uh, popular idea yeah. and I tried to explain it but it goes back to that Mencken thing <laughs> complex uh, <laughs> right. subjects uh, aren't always uh, identified with simple and clear answers um, I think that I could have done a better job in presenting that concept to the public because I think because I think it would have done tremendous things with regard to our pension systems, with regard to our infrastructure investments that were necessary. And I think it would have put the state on a much better financial footing for a long time. And I don't think it would have hurt much of anybody. Yeah. Uh, I, I know I caught a lot of static because it was going to increase the tolls 100% in seven years. Well, they were up 100% in seven years anyway. Right. So I, and we would have had more to present to the public. So I feel I didn't do my job by accomplishing what I 
set out to do, which was restructure the finances of the state. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, both uh, both great points. Um, I'm not going to let you get away with something you said earlier, and that is that you described yourself, and I know what you mean. You described yourself as lucky, and I appreciate that. You know, some say blessed, some say lucky, um, but I want to pin you down a little bit and ask if you could share maybe one or two traits that you either have, born with, developed, cultivated over over your life. Uh, that you know what you look back on and say, you know what, these traits or this trait has served me really well. What is it? I think there are, I think there are three as I'm sitting here. If I sure. went and thought Please. about it for a week, it might be longer. But mm-hmm. um, I learned to work hard when I was a kid. I grew up on a farm. You, you had chores at six o'clock in the morning before you went to school, and you had stuff to do all the time. And it was just part of uh, it was part of life. I had parents that dem- <laughs> demanded that I do well in school, so I had to work hard at that part of my efforts. And so it became easy for me to think that putting in effort was just part of the deal. You know, I didn't, yeah, sure. didn't think otherwise. I was in sports, and mm-hmm. that was the same. It always was reinforced that working hard counts. Second thing is that I've always thought that you do better when you're in a team of okay. people. And if you like people and you're willing to listen as well as um, – always trying to be the leader, I think you can get a lot done. Because there's a lot of people have a lot of good ideas. And, you know, if you can absorb those and give people the credit that they're due, uh, that's great. And the last thing with me, and um, it's both been a blessing and a occasional uh, car crash, is I believe in taking risk. Mm. I've always believed. Wow. You know, that was also part of a farmer's life. You know, you put the seeds in the ground and you pray like hell, you don't get a flood, you don't right. get hail. You know, and I saw my father struggle with risk all his life. Um, and uh, I absorbed the willingness to do that. Uh, I'll give one last example. Please? Yeah. Um, didn't work out the exactly like I wanted but you know I was a pretty decent basketball player in high school uh, and I wanted to play in college Illinois is a big school so and I wasn't that tall and but I went out on the walk-on day and there were I don't know 150 200 kids they took two kids and I was one of those and it was a and it was a it was a mental risk to feel like you were not going to make things happen but it was a risk I took and it made me feel like you should take risks in life Uh, they need to be calculated you need to understand Mm -hmm. upsides and downsides but if you don't take risks things don't happen I'd never been to New York City to the first day that I walked in the door at Goldman Sachs oh wow I'd never been uh A little bit different than the farm, huh? Yeah, everything. (laughs) But I encourage people to understand that risk is part of how you get to rewards. You need to do it carefully, thoughtfully, but take risks. So I like people. I like risks. You work hard. You work damn hard, too. So, yeah, that's uh, uh, those are. Wise words, I think, um, um, as I ruminate on them, and um, your delivery of them is uh, truly authentic, so I appreciate it. Um, You know, I want to bring us back to populism as we wind down, and it it seems to me that one of the darker elements of populism is this sort of obsession with winning and victory and triumphalism, Um, Mm -hmm. and and that's certainly something that served the American spirit well at at times, historically, the Second World War and so on, but um, I want to ask you, and maybe maybe I'll write a book on political loss, but I want to ask you, what have you learned from defeat? 
Well, <laughs> or lost. It is. Winning is a hell of a lot better than sure, losing, I'll sure. promise you that. But, <laughs> okay. um, uh, but it's not the end of the world. Um, when things happen that you didn't want to happen, you have to, depending on what stage of life you are, you have to try to use that as a learning experience mm-hmm. to, to improve what you take on in the uh, succeeding times. I think I've done that from time to time because there's lots of interspersed setbacks in, in life. Um, winning is not winning is also comes with uh, uh, burdens. Sometimes hmm. it also comes with building weaknesses in people and blind spots because maybe they got lucky and so they believed that um, they were right and it wasn't just the you know, coming together of a set of circumstances or sort of events that led things to happen. I certainly have tried to examine my life to know whether um, the outcome was um, an issue of good fortune or it was an issue of effort and the other things that I talked about that you're about. Um, winning, winning can breed arrogance, and I think one including our nation, sure, needs to understand that as well. And I think sometimes we lose track of that. And I think that's, um, unfortunately, way too often built into this populism that's going not only here in the United States but around the globe and ends up having people make huge mistakes over time that can be very costly to mankind. Governor Corzine, a final word. Do you still feel hopeful, optimistic about the future of this country? I'm an optimist, absolutely. Uh, 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 there's, we're in desperate need of a strong, balanced, charismatic leader that can can speak to the people, but understands problems are complex. And answers are not simple. Yeah. Uh, if we find that, and we have throughout our history, as I think I alluded to earlier, and I, I think we will. And I think the basic thread of America is way more good than bad. And so, and we are doing a reasonable, reasonable job of educating our kids if we can can improve that even more, I think we have a very, very bright future. Well, thank you for this uh, short time. You gave us a bit of a master class on populism, but also um, the values uh, that I think can and hopefully will push us through as a society and as a country. So, Governor Corzine, we are lucky to have you. My pleasure. I had fun. Thank you. Today's podcast has been brought to you by the Eagleton Institute of Politics. Eagleton is a nonpartisan research unit of Rutgers University, New Brunswick. This moment in democracy was made possible in part by the generosity of Gerald and Kiko Harvey and Eagleton's many supporters. To support Eagleton's work or sign up for its newsletter, click the link in the description. Please help support the work we do at this moment in democracy. Visit our podcast page at eagleton.rutgers.edu to learn more. We want to hear from our listeners. Email us at podcast at eagleton.rutgers.edu to send in your comments about today's episode or suggest topics that you want to hear about. That's all for today. Thank you for joining us on This Moment in Democracy. Thank you.